Actually, um, our speaker, Dr. Alexander Wayne, was also chairing the section the other day, but let me introduce the speaker once again to the audience. Uh, Dr. Alexander Wayne is the Assistant Academic Director at the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies and Joint Editor of the Journal of the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies. His work focuses on the intellectual history of Indian Buddhism and the Theravada tradition. Dr. Alexander Wayne is also the author of influential publications and to name some of them, the Origin of Buddhist Meditation, published by Rob Ledge in 2007, and Buddhism, an Introduction, published in 2015. So not taking much of your time, much of our time, may I cordially invite Dr. Alexander Wayne, who is already on the stage, to deliver the closing lecture. Dr. Alexander Wayne, please. Okay, we have my presentation. Good afternoon, everybody, and it's a great honor to be speaking here. Thank you, Venerable Damasami, for inviting me. And good afternoon to the members of the Sangha and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just reflecting on what we've been talking about in this conference, I don't think that what we've had enough of is early studies, early Buddhism. We talk a lot about dependent origination. What did the Buddha really teach? How can we know that? Part of what we were talking about included the concepts of pariyati and patipada. So these concepts first arise in the context of the writing down of the Dipitaka in the first century BC. There was a debate. There were some monks who said we should focus on patipada, practice. And then there were other monks who said, no, we should focus on pariyati, scriptural learning. So what is more important? It's a perennial debate. Uh, back in the first century BC in Sri Lanka, it was the monks who promoted pariyati, scriptural learning. And the, they used this argument. They said, even if there's a herd of a thousand cows, young cows to be fed, if they don't have a mother to feed them and nourish them, the tradition will die out. So they compared this to the Buddhist Sangha. They said that even if there are skilled meditators who skilled and adept in vipassana, they won't be able to penetrate the path without learning, pariyati. So that is the importance of pariyati in the Theravada tradition. How do we understand pariyati now? I would say that we need to understand it also in a historical sense. In the first century BC, Theravada Buddhists had a fairly good idea of the Buddha. They were still living in that type of society. It's now nearly, it's 2,000 years later. The Buddha is a lot more distant from our understanding of the world. How do we get back to the Buddha? We study the text historically. It's one aspect. So today I'm going to look at one text, a very important text on dependent origination, the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta. So just to repeat what I've been saying then, how should we study the Pali tradition? Do we study the Pali text as an aspect of Theravada, or can we study them independently? How do we understand a thinker like Buddha Gosa? The Pali tradition with the Visuddhimagga, the Abhidhamata Sangaha, all these great texts, do we need them to study the Buddha? What about other thinkers, Vasubandhu, the Sarvastivadin tradition? Now, no doubt these thinkers, all of this, these great traditions have much to tell us. But from a historical perspective, they're saying something a little bit different. In particular, they belong to different periods of thought. Buddha Gosa, Vasubandhu, they belong to exegetical traditions, traditions of interpretation which develop over the years, over the centuries, over the millennia. And what do we know from the teaching of dependent origination? There is continuity, but there is also change. So just to, as a starting point, I just want to introduce three terms which are important in the study of Buddhism. First of all, philology is the study of languages. 
Now, philology is a historical concern. We want to know what words the Buddha used, what ideas he used. Then we have to study, well, what type of world did the Buddha live in? What type of society? Who was he speaking with? So the Buddha is not somebody that comes out of nowhere. He belongs to a time and place. Philology is the way that we study the text and try to understand it from that period of time. So philology is a sort of text-critical history. Now this is different but overlaps with exegesis. Exegesis is interpreting the Dhamma. Interpreting the Dhamma is, of course, extremely important. But it's not the same. History is not exegesis. What someone like Buddha Gosa would be doing is not what we do when we study the Buddha historically. There are two different approaches, and the two different approaches can inform each other, and you can gain much out of each other, but it's important to remember that they're different. When we look at the study of early Buddhist texts, well, actually, as an academic discipline, it doesn't really go back very far. Maybe about 150 years in, in European universities, about that time, the Pali texts have been studied critically, academically. It's a new way of looking at Dhamma. In, I think it was 1881, the Pali Text Society was founded in London, in the United Kingdom, which is almost 150 years, nearly 150 years. So the Pali tradition has been well known in the West for a long time. This gives a sort of misrepresentative idea amongst Western academics about what the Pali tradition is and what should be done with it. Everybody thinks that a lot of work has been done on the Pali tradition. Actually, it's still largely unstudied. The literary history of the Pali tradition is not really understood very well. We haven't really stratified the texts. Now, stratification means separating out the text into different ideas, different periods of time, different developments. So here is a very simple example. It's traditionally held that the Tipitaka is the teaching of the Buddha, which consists of the suttas, the Vinaya, and the Abhidhamma. When we go and look back at the early accounts of, let us say, the first council, so the first council after the Buddha's death in Rajagaha, what do we find? Ananda recites the suttas. Upali recites the Vinaya. Who recites the Abhidhamma? Nobody. <laughs> the text doesn't say anything about the Abhidhamma then. So the Abhidhamma is this important work of interpreting and understanding the Buddha's teaching. According to the early Buddhist texts, it wasn't there in the beginning. So that is the historical approach. Now, I'm not saying that one is preferable. I'm just saying that there are different approaches. What about dependent origination then? It's such an important doctrine, and we think about it in such received ways. Can we look at the teaching with fresh eyes? Can we think about it differently? Can we question it? Did the idea build up over time, and were the different ideas in the beginning? There are two, I suppose, within the classical 12-fold understanding of dependent origination. There are two, I'd say there are two orientations. There is continuity, seemingly continuity over lives. And the Theravada tradition focuses on this. It ex dependent origination explains continuity without a, an Atman, a soul. So that is one aspect of looking at dependent origination. Continued experience throughout different lifetimes. Within this doctrine, though, there's another focus. There's a focus on what is happening in the present, what is going on with a person's experience in the present moment, and how is that experience constructed? How can you understand your experience to conquer your suffering? So that is the present moment focus also of dependent origination. How do these two focuses, uh, how do they interact, how do they relate? Well, an interesting text for this is the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta. 
the great discourse on the destruction of thirst. So this text has at least three doctrines, three versions of dependent origination. Let's look at them now. So the, the text then is, of course, one of the really, um, from a historical point of view, and also simply as entertainment, it's a good text. Because it starts off with a, a Buddhist bhikkhu who completely misunderstands the Buddha. So this is good fun. There are a few texts like this where you have a bhikkhu who gets it wrong. And this is what happens in the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta. We have a bhikkhu Sati. And Sati, the text keeps telling us, is just a fisherman's son. So a little bit unfair on Sati. Why couldn't a fisherman's son understand the Dhamma? But anyway, he can't. He understands the Dhamma as a form of Upanishadic essentialism. So this is the, the statement that is attributed to Sati. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this very consciousness which transmigrates, not another. So as the story has it, Sati, the Buddha is staying in Savati. One of his, well, Savati is one of the main centers of early Buddhism. The Buddha is there, a lot of bhikkhus are there, Sati is there. The bhikkhus hear that Sati has this opinion. And the bhikkhus think, oh dear. They go to see Sati and they say, come on Sati, you can't be serious. You surely can't understand the Dhamma like this. And Sati says again, yes I do, I understand it exactly like this. It is this very consciousness which transmigrates, not another. So they think, my gosh, we better tell the Buddha about this. They go and see the Buddha and tell him everything that has happened. And he says, oh, the Buddha says, oh my gosh, bring Sati here. Tell him that the teacher has summoned him. So they go and get Sati. Sati sits down in front of the Buddha. And the Buddha asks Sati, is this your opinion, Sati? And he says again, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this very consciousness that transmigrates, not another. So finally, after all this, the Buddha says, Sati insults us, he destroys himself, and he keeps on generating much demerit. I think that means that he keeps repeating his mistake. Sati keeps getting it wrong, and he won't back down. So the Buddha does put Sati in his place by using the teaching of dependent origination. However, at the end of the discourse, the Buddha says, Remember, this is my concise account of liberation by destroying thirst. Whereas the bhikkhu Sati, the fisherman's son, has got tan tangled up in a tangle of thirst, a great net of thirst. So a little, a nice joke, a pun, Sati is a fisherman's son, he's caught in a net. But interestingly, this is called a, a concise teaching. It's in the Majjhima so it's not a long discourse of the Buddha, but it could be. It could easily be in the Diga Nikaya. It's 15 pages long in the Pali Tech Society edition, and that's abbreviated. In full, it would probably be about 20 pages. But that is not a concise teaching of the Buddha, as concise teachings of the Buddha are usually understood. So something has happened with the text. As the text has been transmitted, people have added their own things. Okay, so if you can read this, you might be able to see that it's quite a complicated structure that we are dealing with. I'm just giving the analysis of the text according to the, the paragraphs of the Burmese Chattasangayana. So it starts off, Sati's wrong view, which we've just looked at. The Buddha counters about, with teachings about the dependent origination of consciousness. And the Buddha compares this to fire. We will look at that shortly. That is the core of the old text. Then there's a rather mysterious and hard to understand discussion about what has come into being. The Buddha doesn't say what has come into being and he seems to assume that people will understand him. So the text gets a little bit difficult. It gets even more difficult in section three. Four nutriments are discussed. We then have a section on personal identity, existing in the future and the past, and how to imagine this. Section five is one of these rare passages in the Pali Canon, 
where the, the subject of transmigration of rebirth is named, and it's called a Gandabha. And a Gandabha in classical Hindu thought and in early Buddhism is a type of deity. It here means the entity which is being reborn. Very strange. Okay, so there's lots of difficult elements in this text. Finally, it concludes with a fairly regular path of jhana ending in liberation. Just to break it down into maybe something a little bit more workable, the six sections break down into four sections. The sections one and two, I think, go together. Sections five and six also go together. So the text maybe isn't quite as complicated as we think. Okay, let's look at then the opening text to get a flavor. The core of the text is section one. We're dealing with consciousness, which the Pali word is vijnana, and the dependent origination of it. So the Buddha starts off by saying to Sati, okay, Sati, where did you get this idea? Why do you think like this? What do you mean by vijnana? And Sati says, it is that which speaks, feels, and experiences the results of good and bad karma here and there. This is exactly like a statement from early Hinduism. So if we go back to the early Brahminic Hindu texts, you can find exact type of statements like this in the Upanishads. Sati has been influenced by the Upanishads, and he's giving that sort of idea. The Buddha then has clarified what Sati is talking about, and then he, he refutes him. The Buddha says there's no arising of consciousness without a cause. So vijnana, for the Buddha, is not some substantial entity which moves from one life to the next. It is something which only arises dependent on causes. So this is a basic Buddhist teaching, a basic principle of dependent origination. To clarify what the Buddha is talking about, he uses the example of fire. So fire is different depending upon what its fuel is. If you burn grass or logs or cow dung, the fire is different. It might smell different. It might look different. It has a different flavor. So that's the same in, with consciousness, according to the Buddha. Your visual consciousness is one thing. Your auditory consciousness is another. Your taste, your smell, feeling things on your body. These are all the different forms of consciousness in the Buddha's teaching. There is no essential core to that. So this is what exactly the Buddha says, how he explains what vijnana is. Consciousness gets defined in dependence on whatever causes it to arise. If it arises dependent on the eye and visual forms, it gets called eye consciousness. So, eye consciousness, chaku vijnana. There is, you cannot take the vijnana out of chaku vijnana and say that the vijnana is a real thing. There is only chaku vijnana, sota vijnana, gana vijnana, different types of vijnana, different episodes of vijnana, mano vijnana. So all of these, there are six in total, a person's experience in the present consists of this flow of these different episodes, different types of vijnana. This is the Buddha's point. What Sati has done, he has elaborated from this. He has taken the vijnana out of these conditioned events. Okay, now this is where it gets a bit complicated. So far we have a fairly, I think, standard teaching on what, how the Buddha understands consciousness. But then the Buddha starts talking about something come into being. Bhutam idang. So the Buddha talks about the, this thing come into being. The arising of this thing come into being. 
and the cessation of this thing come into being. So the cessation of this thing come into being, the Buddha would ask, O bhikkhus, this thing come into being, do you see that if it has no nutriment, it is subject to cessation? Niroda Dhammang. What is the Buddha talking about here? Buddha Gosa, the exegetical tradition, interprets Bhutta as the five aggregates. Now, the five aggregates aren't mentioned in this text, and what we're talking about is one of the aggregates, vijnana. In fact, the way that the Buddha is talking about Bhutang, Idang, it makes it impossible for him to be talking about the five aggregates. That is not how the canonical texts discuss the five aggregates. So, Buddha Gosa's interpretation from a historical point of view isn't correct. However, there's a very easy answer. The easy reference to Bhutta, Bhutam Idam, is Vijnana. Bhutam Idam is we, we want a neuter noun. Vijnana is a neuter noun. We've just been talking about Vijnana. We've been talking more specifically about Vijnana and its fuel, its cause. Now we're talking about Vijnana and its cause with a different metaphor. We're talking about, the, we're using the metaphor of food, nutriment. So this section, then the Buddha is, the Buddha sort of cross-questions the bhikkhus about their understanding of consciousness. Do you see that consciousness only comes about under particular circumstances? Okay, so just to, I'm going to jump to section four now. But just to reiterate then, sections one or two of the text, they seem to be coherent. This seems to be the Buddha talking about one particular thing in response to a particular situation when he was teaching. He is, the Buddha is deconstructing consciousness. He is saying that consciousness is caused. And he's using two metaphors to talk about this causality the metaphor of fuel, and the metaphor of food. Consciousness is like almost a material thing. It's like fire. Take the fuel away, and there is none of it. So consciousness isn't an intrinsically real substance. Okay, so just if we hold that thought in our head, now think about this, our, our present moment consciousness we feel that it continues from the past to the present to the future. It seems like there is this seamless continuity. We have this feeling of being awake and it continuing. Now that is the common sense view that we have. That is what the bhikkhu sati is understanding consciousness as. And the Buddha is saying something more challenging. He's saying that this continuity isn't real. It's a sort of illusion we have. So from this perspective, section four of the text makes some sort of sense. If you understand that your present moment awareness is constructed, if you really understand that, the Buddha is saying, you won't ask questions such as, what will I be in the future? What was I in the past? How do I exist in the present? So if your view, if you have deconstructed your view of personal identity, these are questions that don't apply. Okay, so these are pretty challenging ideas. You know, this is where the Buddha's Dhamma is quite difficult. It challenges how we think about ourselves. But in this text, we have what seems to be a coherent, a coherent dialogue between the Buddha and his followers in sections one, two, and four. We've missed out section three. Now, this is where it gets pretty tricky as a textual, a text historical analysis. Section three seems to jump out of this analysis of present moment consciousness. The Buddha starts talking about four foods, four aharas, which he explains are material food, contact, intention, and consciousness. And he says that these are the supports for the endurance of beings who have come into being. 
and for assisting those beings seeking the rising. So we've, we have sort of moved slightly from the present moment focus. We're now talking about continuity over time. Okay, so the Buddha introduces these four foods. And then he says, okay, so what is the origin of these foods? And he says, it is thirst. What is the, the origin of thirst? It is sensation. What is the origin of sensation? It is contact. And so on and so on. It goes back through the chain of dependent origination. So we have the classical doctrine of dependent origination here. And for several pages, the text continues going backwards and forwards. As a text critical historian, I'm trying to answer the question when I read this, how has this text been expanded? The Buddha said himself it's a concise teaching, but it isn't concise. We're looking for things that have been added, and if something has been added, this looks like it could be it. What we have in section three is a section of text which is you giving new definitions to words that have been used in sections one and two. So in sections one and two of the text, we have the words Buddha, Ahara, Sambhava. In section three, all of these words are being used differently. There is a very subtle conceptual difference. It's subtle, but real. So what seems to be happening is that we have another piece of tradition. That other piece of tradition is the classical doctrine. And at some point as the texts are being transmitted from one generation to the other, one piece of text has been moved into another piece. Not written text, of course, we're still in the age of oral recitation. So just to present how I think the text has grown, Sections 1, 2, and 4 that we've just been discussing, they seem to be the old core of the text. They fit together quite seamlessly. The ideas of them seem to form a nice continuous thread. You can follow it as one teaching, the Buddha, in, an, in a number of different ways that I, I cannot go into here also. The terminology, the style of discussion, it is a nice, concise Dhamma teaching. And then we have quite a long section, three, which comes in, it gives new definitions, and it gets away from the core teaching. So that is text-critical history. We're looking at the different pieces of the tradition, trying to understand them. Okay, so just to go over what is happening here, what I think is happening. There is an old text. It's consisting of sections one, two, and four. At some point, it's been expanded. And before the end, I'll talk about when I think this expansion might have happened. So the old core of the text, Sati, he thinks that this feeling of being conscious is a transmigrating substance. It's like a sort of soul that is talked about in Hinduism. The Buddha says, no, it certainly isn't. This is not my teaching. And he's very clear about that. We then get a section, which is number three, with a very long teaching on dependent origination. It gets away from the gist of the core text. Okay, now that's not it. There's two more sections to discuss in the text. Sections five and six, now they also look like an addition. We, well, I can't rule out the possibility that some form of them goes back to the, the original version of this text, but it also looks like it's adding new ideas. So we actually have a quite strange and wonderful teaching of dependent origination, beginning with the Gandaba's descent into the womb of a mother. Okay, a woman becomes pregnant is explained by the descent into the womb of some sort of thing being, which will be reborn. The baby is born. The baby is nourished by the mother. 
The young boy matures through adolescence, playing various games. He, the young person, the young man, becomes habituated to pleasure. It happens to all of us. We grow up, we build up our, our likes and dislikes. Then the Buddha eventually gets to the, the links in the classical chain of dependent origination, right at the end of this account. So from the time the Buddha mentions attachment, it's pretty far along in the, the list of dependent origination. Let's say. So to put this into, in, into contrast, into sharp contrast, here are the three schemes of dependent origination in the text. Scheme one is the old core of the text. The Buddha's not giving an extended analysis. He's just talking about vijnana. Scheme two is the classical doctrine. Scheme three is this quite peculiar doctrine which only approximates the classical doctrine right at the end. So scheme three, you have the mother and the father and the entity to be reborn. Then there is descent into the womb. The woman gives birth. She nourishes the baby with her lifeblood. The young child matures, his sense faculties ripen. The young child plays various games. The young adolescent becomes used to and enjoys the different types of sensual pleasure. So the person as the process of conditioning builds up, the person gets used to favoring certain experiences and disliking other experiences. The person becomes attached to those different reactions. And the person derives pleasure from the experience. From pleasure there is attachment, from attachment becoming, from becoming old age, and birth, death, sorrow, lamentation, etc. So what do we do when we see this? When we have this very complicated text, we have three different teachings, we have a context, the nidana of the text is the Buddha trying to persuade one of his bhikkhus not to be so stupid. And that is just this scheme one. We have these schemes two and three. It's difficult to work out how it all fits together. Okay, so the, the final account of, of dependent origination with the, the birth of a baby and the maturation of the young adolescent. That account of dependent origination shows how he gets trapped in attachment and suffering. As a remedy to this, the Buddha then sets out the path to awakening. So in the final part of the text, we get quite a long account of the, the Buddha's path to awakening. It's a standard sutta account. It's just like what you have in the Samanyapala Sutta. The liberating inside portion of this account is, is perhaps a bit unusual in the Pali Canon. It gives a cessationist account of dependent origination from the point of having attained the fourth jhana. So once you attain the fourth jhana, the experiential forces that trap you to rebirth, they, be, they come undone and you get liberated. So if I just go back and this scheme three explains how you become attached, how you get into suffering. The solution to that scheme is to go through the path focusing on the four jhanas. Once you get to the four jhanas, you neither favor, favor experience or oppose experience. You're completely detached. If you're detached, you have no pleasure or delight. If you take no pleasure in your experience, you have no clinging or becoming. And so the entire mass of suffering ceases. Okay, so that is what happens in section six. It's another long section. It's in this section that we get the title of the sutta, the account of liberation through destroying thirst. 
And it's right at the end, the Buddha says, okay, but the final thing is the bhikkhusati, the fisherman's son, he's got tangled up in a, a tangle of thirst, a great net of thirst. What are the historical implications of this? We study the Tipitaka. How do we understand it? Well, it looks to me like the composition of this particular sutta has taken time. It doesn't go back to one single event. Different pieces of tradition have been put together, and that is what we have in the received text. Probably we have three different sections. Section one to two, the episode with Sati, the focus on the present moment and how experience is working in the present moment. That is the core of the text. Section five to six, this, this uh, unusual teaching of dependent origination. How do we view that? I'm thinking of it as maybe a sort of trial run for the classical doctrine. As the classical doctrine is being thought out, maybe this is one of the steps towards conceptualizing the idea. The classical doctrine is very sophisticated, but the idea of a Gandaba being reborn is not so sophisticated. So finally, the final layer in the sophistication of the tradition is adding the full teaching of dependent origination. So you have the classical scheme. It's elegant and sophisticated, but you still it does disrupt the original form of the text. It's a little bit more difficult to understand what the Buddha was saying on a particular occasion with a particular monk. A few more historical reflections then. The Chinese Majjama Agama version of the text is extremely close to the Pali Sutta. The Chinese Majjama Agama is from the Sarvastivadin school. I believe. It's been studied by Bhikkhu Analayo in a comparative study of the Majjama Nikaya, Volume 1. So Analayo's conclusion, he, Analayo brings to light a lot of interesting things about what's in one text and what isn't in another text. But he says, he, he concludes, the, the present discourse's main concern is dependent arising. Well, of course it is. And there are three versions of that. And both, all three versions of that are in each text. All of these three versions must have been in the original before the two schools separated. This would mean that the text in its original form must go back to before 250 BC, around the time of the Ashokan missions, how Buddhism came to Sri Lanka and then Southeast Asia. The comparative study of Pali texts with their Chinese counterparts is extremely important. It's a Chinese translation. It's not a Mahayana text. It's from a Chinese tradition which was very close to the Theravada tradition. So it's important to understand what is in those different versions of Dhamma. What is actually in them is usually very similar. There's not much difference. It's a little bit more fruitful to look at the different parts of the sutta and see how do these, how do these relate to everything else in the Sutta Pitaka. And what we find is that different pieces of the Mahatana Sankhya Sutta have been taken out and expanded and given different treatments in the Sangyutta Nikaya and the Anguttara Nikaya. Okay, so I think that's a really important conclusion to, to reach. The Majjhimanik, this Majjhimanikaya discourse has been studied, thought about, and it has inspired new suttas. Very complex process of composition and creation has happened. So how do we understand early Buddhism? What I would like you to take away, uh, because this it's nice to be speaking here in a Buddhist studies university. The Theravada world really needs a very good Buddhist studies university. So I hope that can happen here. Pariyati, the mastery of scripture. It has to look outside scripture. 
It has to be historical. You have to try and understand Scripture not just from within the tradition. It's important to look and think, what was the world in which these suttas were composed? What was it like to be alive in the Buddha's age? What language did he speak? What ideas did they have? That's all really important. How did the early Buddhists receive the Buddha's teachings? How did they transmit it and think about it? That is a job of history. And for that, you have to go outside at any individual tradition. You have to do comparative study. Doing comparative study is not just about history. It's not just about understanding the history of thought, understanding the history of literature. It can be philosophical. If you analyze different texts into their different pieces, you can start to think about what is in the text much more closely. So you can start to really hone your understanding of Dhamma. What does this section really mean? You have to ask questions then reading this text. How does it relate to the twelvefold form of dependent origination? What about the form of the text, the teaching that talks about a Gandabha? Strange idea. How do we explain that? Did the Buddha have that idea? If he did have that idea, how does it relate to the twelvefold doctrine? Finally then, what about this focus? This is a... I'm saying that we have, a, we have two different fo points of focus in the text. One is about present moment experience, and the other is about continuity over lifetimes. Now, those two perspectives need not conflict. They might complement each other. But we have to think about that. We have to take the two different approaches seriously, understand what they're trying to say, and see where they're coming from. Okay, then, I've been talking a bit about Pariyati and Patipada, and I hope that you, well, my point is hopefully not too complicated. History can help with pariyati. In the modern world, it's important. It's over, what is it, nearly two and a half thousand years since the Buddha. We need history. Okay, so that is all. Thank you very much. Maybe we can have some questions. Thank you very much, Alex, for a very nice lecture. I have two questions which are closely interrelated, and uh, perhaps I suspect you will uh, disagree with me, but as you know, I am a little skeptical of uh, stratigraphy, mm. and in this case, your talk um, made me even more skeptical. Especially the, the first part, when you said that this is basically clearly an interpolation, and Buddha Gosa is wrong in his interpretation. I felt that it was a bit too strongly expressed. I would say rather that Buddhaghosa disagrees with your hypothesis regarding the stratigraphy of the text, and so do I. Like, I do not find that the Buddha Midam and the Ahara sections look particularly out of place. Mm. So I, I wonder why you feel that that is so obvious. And uh, connected to this section, I would like to add that perhaps rather than saying that there is such a sharp distinction between exegesis and uh, historical philology, and that basically ancient exegetes did not have history. I would rather say that they had a different idea of history from your own, and this affected their understanding of the formation and the nature of the texts and the way in which they interpret it. Mm. Well, yes, I, I'm drawing a sharp distinction, but I'm also accepting that there is an overlap. I mean, I'm not saying that the distinction is black and white. So, no doubt, I think there's a lot of historical information in the commentarial tradition, in the exegetical tradition, um, not just about different types of words or historical events, but also their interpretation of ideas. So, yeah, I am sympathetic to your point of view, but still trying to stress because I don't think there is enough stress on the point of distinction. And so that is why I'm putting it like that. 
For this particular point about interpreting Bhutang Idang as uh, Pancha Kandakam, Kanda Panchakam, um, it's an unusual thing to say to a, that type of statement just isn't found in the, the canonical texts. Now, it, what that means, what Buddha Gosar is saying is that Bhutang Idang, he's taking Bhutang to refer to the whole human being. But there is no such statement in the, in the text which says Bhutang or Satang or Puggalang, a person or any the person as a whole is never said to be Niroda Dhamma, which is what is, the term Bhuta is qualified by this Bahubihi, Niroda Dhamma. Now, Niroda Dhamma is usually applied to aspects of experience. Individual kandas, not the whole kandas, though. So, there is a philological point of view of that. But there's a little bit more that I couldn't go into. And you'll be delighted to hear that the, all of this analysis has been published in the Journal of the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for your lecture. I have a very brief question. So I, I might agree that, of course, uh, there are some interpolations. Mm. But how do we know that a text that has been interpolated later, we know that the interpolation happens after the composition of the text. And how do we know that this bit, this portion, is not older mm. than the text? We don't know that. So we, we have, what I'm saying is, um, we're having, we have three different pieces, I think. Now, any of those pieces could be older than the other. For this particular... They are, with regards to the composition of this particular text, particular pieces have been brought in, is my claim, my interpretation. But as for the age of those pieces, yes, you're right. We cannot, on the basis of this analysis, we, we cannot draw conclusions. To do that would require different arguments. Uh, so, I have a question uh, to you. Uh, but for upon, I thank you. Thank you for your lecture. It's very really good. It gave me my power to study Tipitika and criticize. But I think uh, the study Tipitika, to study Tipitika of Western scholar uh, and uh, scholar in South Asia are different. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, Scholar in South Asia, they're not to criticize the text like this, but you then to criticize the text, as you mentioned. Question: Do you have any theory in your mind, Professor? Please. Theory about? Could you just? Sorry, I didn't quite follow. Do I have any theory about what? Your question, you asked me, do I have a theory? A theory about what? I didn't catch that. Uh, the theory for criticizing. Theory the of criticizing? Yeah, yeah. Do you have any theory in no. your mind? No, no theory. You criticize from uh, uh, all? Uh, there are different, OK, I suppose what you mean is, um, what sort of hermeneutic or approach or methodology do I have? Um, I'm saying there are different methodologies, different approaches, different ways of critically studying the texts. One of the ways of doing it is within different exegetical traditions. Another way of doing it is what Bhikkhu Analeo is doing a lot of now, is comparing the Pali Nikayas with the Chinese Agamas. This type of analysis is sort of um, literary criticism looking at the internal coherence of not just an individual text, but how it relates to the wider canon of a, just a particular canon. And I suppose there is also a comparative element which I'm using as well. I'm looking at this within, within trying to build up a, a picture of the early Buddhist world. So when the Buddha is responding to Sati, and this monk Sati who gets it wrong, if we don't know what is in the early Hindu texts, we can't really understand where he's coming from so well. But if we put it in a historical context, it makes it easier to understand. So I suppose comparative, a comparative approach is one, and a literary critical approach is another. They're not the only ones. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that talk. 
I'm just trying to understand the uh, Gandabha version of uh. the Patitsa Samupada. So is it supposed to correspond directly to the links? Uh, this is one thing I couldn't quite uh, get clear on. And the other is um, we have Vijayati is born, but then Sakena Lohitena Poseti, or mm. Jatam Sakena Lohitena Poseti, nourishes the mother the nourishes Jata is the child born yeah, with, with the, her own blood. With her blood. It just means the breast milk of the mother. It explains that. I see. Okay. It's obscure, right? But then Indriyani, how do you put, so this comes afterwards. Usually this would happen in the process of uh, embryonic maturation. Uh, I suppose I mean breastfeeding. Oh, no, sorry. I'm, I'm thinking about the Indriyas now at this point. Okay. Well, yeah, I suppose what they, the gist of the text and what they're trying to say is you have a young child is born and innocently is playing games and growing up. But as the faculties develop, it's then that you start to get attached to things. Whereas in, the, in early childhood, maybe it's not so you know, set. Your preferences and likes are not set. They develop over time. But anyway, this, the scheme is not technical. It's rough and ready. It certainly doesn't correspond to any of these, these links in the classical doctrine. I, well, um, it doesn't appear to. There are other texts in the Pali Canon which talk about you know, the descent into the womb and the, I think the development of consciousness and name and form. So we probably could flesh this out a little bit more, but I haven't done that yet. And maybe a good place to look would be Frauwana's History of Indian Philosophy. I think he discusses some of this. But yeah, thanks for those points. I mean, the, I have tried to make, tried to show that this scheme three is, an in, it's a unique scheme. It doesn't correspond exactly with the classical scheme. So it's, I leave that as a question to be studied. So, any more questions or comments from the audience? Any comments? From our rector Seattle? I don't actually have any comment. I just would like to thank uh, Dr. Alex Quinn um, for emphasizing the importance of um, historical development. Um, I think we do, but we don't do enough, this one. And, that is, in the tradition, the, the honor that we give to the commentator, we, we call them Buddha Madanyu, the author who know the wishes of the Buddha. But the commentator themselves, they don't actually say, they don't actually call themselves that way. But whenever I, they say something new, they will say, Jindayitwa Kahedapa. They actually ask you to reflect before you accept it. So, this is uh, the tradition. Actually, we have a lot, a lot of texts, okay, uh, criticizing each other during the Lady Sierra's uh, time here. Lady Sierra's. Um, South commentary is called Brahmata uh, um, uh, Tiffany, and, uh, he w and uh, there's another Sierra uh, who was criticizing him. Uh, his, his work is, is known as Ankuratika. So, this kind of you know, criticism you know, is not new to, to Myanmar. And if we read the, the uh, commentary themselves, uh, you can see that there are some different opinions in the commentary. Now, related to your lecture about Gandhapa, I think, uh, I'm not quite sure if the third section is a later addition, because in terms of the theme, the subject, is it not that far-fetched? Uh, Vinyana and Gandhapa. But interesting, when you quote uh, Analyo Bhikkhu and the book that I showed yesterday, okay, rebirth in early Buddhism, 
where he has done some comparative study. In terms of rebirth consciousness, the traditional interpretation is h u i n y a n a People would point to that. Uh, he is saying something that no, it's not v i n a n a It's in Nama Rupa. It's a, it's, it's in there. This is what he says. This is something that gives us more thought. I think uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you again, Dr. Alexander Wynn. Is my classmate when I did my PhD at Oxford, and our, our, our teacher, Professor Richard Cambridge. Actually, likes his work very much. I should say here. And the other day, Professor Asanka was not here when I was welcoming you. He was one of those professors who gave me the reference into Oxford. So thank you once again, and to everyone, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Venerable Rector s i a r o p i a and all the. Uh, speaker Dr. Alex Wayne and all the professors for the active and lively uh, dialogue.